Hi Youtubers, welcome to Amazing Gadgets. You may be here because you are a subscriber to my channel or because you are trying to figure out how to do high speed photography. And that's exactly what I will be teaching you today. Two weeks inside it, and uh, let me tell you what launching an endeavor is like. So after about a year of training, uh, you finally are down in Florida and you put on a big old ugly orange suit that makes your bottom look big, <laughs> and you waddle out to the uh, to the little bus that takes you out to the launch pad. And up the elevator you go. It's about four in the morning, maybe three thirty in the morning. It's about thirty five degrees out and really cold. I had to borrow some gloves. For one of the so right now, you may be wondering why do I have this video clip of this guy talking about the Space Shuttle Endeavor and what it's like being inside. Well, if you're not very familiar with the news or you don't follow up on the current updates, you may know that recently Endeavor has retired. Endeavor is a space shuttle that has flown 25 missions including 12 to help construct and f outfit the space station and it logged nearly 123 million miles in flight during the 4,670 orbit, 71 orbits it performed. It has served us a very long time and helped us further understand our amazing and unique universe. However, as with everything, it has to retire. So, Sorry, <laughs> getting my notes behind the back here. So, on September 21st, 2012, that's exactly what it did. It made its flight from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida all the way to the Science Center Museum in L.A. And along the route, it passed over uh, lots of famous landmarks, including the NASA Moffett Field near Mountain View, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Monterey. Those are just some of the landmarks and I was able to go to the event near Mountain View at the NASA Moffett Field and I was able to take some photos there. And I thought, what a great subject. I'm pretty sure all of you are excited about spaceships, right? Space shuttles, spaceships. I know all of you are interested and what great subject to do on high speed photography than this. I could show you some photos I took there while teaching you guys high speed photography. You're going to enjoy this video. If you're interested in the rest of the speech, I will actually be adding that to the end of this video. So if you want to watch the entire speech, well, at least the part I videotaped, I didn't videotape the whole thing, by the way. I only videotaped part of it. Um, you can watch it at the end of this video. So yeah, let's go ahead and... Uh, show you some of the settings I use for high-speed photography. When doing high-speed photography, you will obviously need to set your camera on TV or shutter priority mode. On Canon cameras, a TV stands for time value. I currently actually have my mode dial set on custom function 3 because I do sometimes do high speed photography and I want to easily access the options that I already uh, set up on the camera for high speed photos and I will teach you how to set the custom functions later in this video so let me show you all the, some of the stuff I set up on here well obviously if the objects flying or like moving you need your camera to set into it L servo. I mean, all these options on the screen can be actually adjusted by the Q button over here. So L servo AI or AI servo, sorry, um, is the focus tracking mode on Canon cameras. I don't know about Nikon's because I obviously don't have one. But the AI servo mode is a focus tracking, which constantly focuses on your subject. And for your uh, the photo take mode, you want the high speed multiple shot mode. So that means it will continuously uh, like burst mode. Yeah, high speed burst mode. 
right here you want to set it on high speed I generally set my AF to zone AF because the focusing mechanism on the whole thing is actually a little off when it's tracking because it only tracks in the center the zone AF is a little better for tracking because you're gonna start because the objects will be in the middle of your viewfinder anyway so I usually use zone AF in the center then I usually use center weight average because if your object's like a bird or something it's actually gonna underexpose the bird for the sky and so I like to use a center weighted average metering because again your subjects will be in the center now you might see I have it on ISO auto here generally I don't like using ISO auto I like to control my ISO but as you know the new firmware update on the EOS 70 actually lets you set the highest maximum ISO and it's actually in the menu here so let's check so it's actually in the third menu and as you can see you can actually set the maximum ISO here so I don't like to go over 800 but for these photos I just put it at 400 because it should be enough so ISO auto if you can set the max great if you can't I would recommend probably not picking the lowest ISO because that's bad you probably want to go between a 200 to 400 ISO depending on how fast the object is going and for the time or the shutter speed you want something fast I usually go with a default of 1 over 1600 second shutter speed because this is pretty much fast enough again I can't give you a definite shutter speed as it depends on how fast the object is traveling when you're taking the photo another tip I would like to give you is I usually enjoy shooting raw plus s or JPEG small and a big raw file because you have more work room later in post processing but this raw photos it just slow down your burst mode I mean if you ever tried doing the burst thing here why don't I just show you turn off so you can actually do this and as you can hear it's gonna actually slow down a bit there it's slowing down because the buffer is full and it cannot uh, take any more photos so and that fast anyways so let's put it back on else AI server mode so yeah um, I like to use raw because there's more room in post processing later but <laughs> if your camera is not that fast maybe you should use JPEG no or I could take off the small JPEG preview I like to have a small preview because it's easier to view the photos on the computer than just having a raw file which can only be only open in Photoshop uh, or special softwares if you plan on using the f same options for high-speed photography like a lot um, I would actually recommend setting it on one of your custom functions on the dial if I turn over the camera you can see there's like three custom functions on the Canon cameras a C1, C2, and C3 that means that you could actually set it so it uses the same options every time so you could have the same options to deal with when you're shooting that particular type of photo so it's, I find it useful I have all three used so for custom function one I actually have it set on up on HDR photography as you can see here the exposure bracketing is activated and I have it on F22 because for landscapes you want the maximum depth of field and it's usually on a tripod anyways for me and I have it on the continuous burst mode for HDR because it's going to be taking three photos on my C2 I have a for the scenario where I am ready to take a landscape photo but I'm too lazy or maybe I don't have my remote shutter release plugged in or with me so I still have it on F22 because I always have my tripod so it doesn't matter so the shutter speed don't matter and I have it I set on a two second delay and for C3 is what you've been looking at here with my high speed photography with all my settings set up 
So, first of all, to set it, you have to put it onto the TV mode. Yeah, so put it onto TV. Okay, shutter. The shutter priority thing. Yeah, yeah shutter priority mode. <laughs> Sorry. Then you press Q and you go ahead and set all the options to whatever you like on here. Just like use the mode, just styles and just dial in the options. All of these will be saved in the custom functions. All the settings, same settings including the shutter speed. Um. Ooh, right. And then you go and press menu like I just did. Um, then you have to go into the. Let's see, where is this? So, which number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The ninth menu over on the Canon EOS 7D. And you should see an option called U Camera User Setting press that, press register, and you just go to the mode dial which you want to register it on, C1, C2, C3, and you press, uh, what is it, and you press set again to set it on that mode dial, since I'm already said I'm not going to press the set button here. Let's move on to some tips for taking photos and how I usually work in the field for these kind of photos. So I'm out here now to show you um, some tips on how to do the photos. And I'm just going to pretend I'm in the field right now working. Now again, like I said before, I can't give you an exact shutter speed because it will depend upon how fast your subject is moving and how well you're good at panning uh, your camera. You no know, panning. Now, first of all, with these high-speed sh shots, you do not need a tripod, actually. So, after you set up the settings and stuff, um, you don't need a tripod. Take the camera off the tripod now. And this first tip, it might not be uh, very good for all types of high-speed photography. But again, like the space shuttle on, f on Friday last week, the space shuttle launch is actually a good one because it's planned and you know when it's coming and you know approximately how fast it's going to be going. So one thing I did that day for that is I actually, since there was their airport was nearby, I actually took some test shots of planes taking off over there to check if my settings will work or not. And it's kind of like these planned events where you know how fast it's going to be going, find an object that's going around the same speed and you can actually take some test shots of the the stuff that's going at about the same speed as what you're going to be trying to take a photo of later to test to see if your settings will blur your image or whatever and yeah that's a really good tip but if you're like taking photos of birds and stuff you, you don't know how they're going to move so and you, you don't know when to expect them, so this tip might not help you out with wildlife photography, but with airplanes and stuff, you know, you could actually take some test shots of airplanes before if there's an important airplane later you want to take a photo of. Just like the space shuttle flyover. So now the second tip for me is, like, you see the air subject flying overhead, right? Let's turn it on. You see it flying overhead and it's like moving, moving, but what I like to do is like take three shots, so continuous first. Let's see. So I do like two to three shots, then I'm gonna try to focus on it again. And I'm gonna take a few more. What this does is because later in post processing, you're obviously not gonna need all those shots, right? You'll need one or two good ones. So as I, like I showed you before, um, after taking lots of raw photos, your camera will actually slow down because the buffer is full. So it's good to like take three shots, but keep keep following the subject as you 
as you wait, then take a few other shots, you know. So also give the camera some time for the AI servo to focus better. Even though it's focusing during the shots, um, it will actually work a lot faster when you're not actually taking a photo. So it will give uh, the AI servo, the tracking system, some time to um, refocus on the subject. And it will also give you some time to uh, frame up your subject again because when the mirror is up you obviously can't see what's going on so I, what I sometimes happen to do by accident is I just like take a photo of the subject and I forget to move the camera when I'm doing it so and I and it's no longer in the frame and I have to reframe it so yeah when you're taking the photo make sure you're, you're moving it even though you can't see the view through the viewfinder when it's uh, when the mirror is clicking that's that's one thing that you have to remember to do so I hope these tips have helped you and again if your subject is completely unpredictable it's pretty much a process of trial and error with a shutter speed there are no tips I can really offer you on the correct shutter speed again it depends on how fast your subject is moving and stuff so <sighs> Everything in photography is trial and error. So that's pretty much the um, main skill of photography, trial and error. I mean, photographers can only teach you the basics. You have to learn the rest yourself. And more pra and it's again, practice makes perfect. So if you get good at this and these tips help you, your photos should look something like this. So the first photo here is of the Boeing 747 taking Endeavour and flying over the NASA Moffat Field. Well the next three photos are all from the event. The first one shows the sum of the building. Again with the composition, I think you should include some foreground and stuff into the shot and background, you know, always. So the first shot was done at 220 millimeters at f5.6, 1 over 1600 second at ISO 160. Again, I set my camera to auto ISO, it should go from 100 to 400, so it shows 160 on this one. So let me give you a moment to look at the image. So the second image is still of Endeavor and it was taken at 190 millimeters. I didn't zoom all the way in because I think also with photos like this, um, especially with like my the, the NASA event thing, I left some margins on the side just to be on the safe side. You know, you got some crop space there. You, you, could, ref you could crop and reframe the photo. So I like to leave some margin on the photo when I zoom into the subject, not just fill the whole frame. And it's fast moving, so I mean you got room for error in case that you, you don't pan all the way that toward it. So I like to leave some margin on the photo. As you can see from these photos, there's some margins on the side. So the second image is at 190 millimeters, F5 and 1 over 1600 second like the first one and this one was shot at ISL 125 and let me give you a moment to look at this photo again so now the third image is still of Endeavor obviously um, this one was shot at 220 millimeters f5.6 f stop 5.6 f5.6 so we, uh, Sometimes photographers like to skip words. So, um, yeah, the, the 5.6 is the aperture, obviously. <laughs> if you're a beginner, well, that's the aperture value when we say f5.6, f stop 5.6, that's the aperture value. Um, it was also taken at 1 over 1,600 of a second. And this one was done at ISO 220. And again, let me give you some time to look at the photo. Okay, now the fourth image is actually not from the event. I took it the next day when I was outside. It's of a pigeon. 
and it was done at 300 millimeters, f5.6, one over 1,600 of a second at ISO 250. Like wildlife, um, I was just lucky with the shutter speed I was able to get it. I actually had a few other shots I messed up on, which I didn't keep, so I can't show you any of those messed up shots. But it was motion blurred and it was slightly out of focus. Again, AI servo, sometimes it will actually hit the subject, sometimes it will. On my other ones, it actually focused on the background instead of the pigeon, so I just erased those immediately. I don't want to keep it, so I can't show it to you. Um, so yeah, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you like photography, I run my own photography blog. A link is in the video description below. I also have more photos from the, uh, the Endeavor flyover. And it's also on my photography blog. I will also have a link in the video description below. So, thanks for watching. And... If you want to see the rest of the speech, I will have a little uh, thank you for watching note that will run for a while. Then I'm going to stick that the part that of the speech I recorded be after that. So yeah, around 15 to 20 seconds slide, then it's going to be the clip. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe if you want more photography tutorials. I will be doing a lot more of this. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now. Rock or what? We're driving a nuclear powered SUV on Mars today, right now. There's people in California at the controls of that. Lots of people in California had a hand in designing it, and the whole NASA family is proud of that. There's an international space station, a million pounds of metal and, and human beings, and the heart and soul of decades of NASA effort working right now. You can see it in the night sky, most of you probably have. And then just in here in a little while, we're going to see an example of some of the most amazing flying machines you've ever seen in your life. Now, just to see a 747 airliner fly down the runway with its gear up at 200 feet is a pretty special thing. And the fact that it's got the most incredible flying machine ever designed on its back is even more amazing. You'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. I've only seen this a couple times myself. But Endeavor's uh, close to me. It's a real special piece to me. I lived for two weeks inside it. And uh, let me tell you what launching an Endeavor is like. So after about a year of training, uh, you finally are down in Florida and you put on a big old ugly orange suit that makes your bottom look big. <laughs> and you waddle out to the, uh, to the little bus that takes you out to the launch pad and up the elevator you go. It's about 4 in the morning, maybe 3.30 in the morning. It's about 35 degrees out and really cold. I had to borrow some gloves from one of the workers there as I stood around in my spacesuit wait, waiting to get on with my rocket ride. After uh, almost two hours of preparation out there on the pad, finally you're strapped in, you're laying on your back. It's completely dark outside. The engines start, there's a huge rumble and shake. And then uh, when the solid rocket boosters and big white rockets on the side, when they light, it's like being rear-ended at a traffic light on, on uh, Castro out there. It's uh, really a big, a big jolt, and you're off, uh, you're off to the sky. We went up through a cloud layer that was lit up like the Fourth of July, even from the inside of the shuttle. About four from the inside, and this was the most spectacular one I've ever witnessed from either inside or out. So that started two weeks of the uh, final construction mission to the space station. They put on this beautiful window on the space station, and then we got to open the covers and look out, out uh, at the Earth for the first time. Just one of the zillions of things that Endeavor has done. And this space shuttle that you're about to see would not have been possible without the people here at NASA Games. Way back when we were all a lot younger, 
maybe not even born yet. People here at NASA Ames, some very wise, creative people, came up with an idea for how a spaceship, a spaceship should be shaped in order to come back to the heat of reentry and survive. So the blunt shape, the kind of a lumpy shape of the shuttle you're going to see here today, really came right out of right here, right where we're standing here. And there, after that, thousands of other people were involved in designing many aspects of the space shuttle. Besides its shape, it's uh, the fact that it had uh, thermal protection tiles on the belly, and I, for which I am very thankful because it kept me cool as we went through uh, almost 3,000 degrees of heat uh, down to the atmosphere. But how come Ames is so special? Is it because they're always uh, engineers and scientists who are geniuses here, much smarter than, than me or anybody else we know? Well, yeah, there's a few people like that, but mostly it's just motivated people who went to school, who studied hard, who rose above their own sense of, of limit to do something nobody would ever done before. And now, the result of that was a spacecraft that did something completely outlandish and audacious. Nobody could have imagined a spacecraft like that would work even one time. And it worked for decades, three decades, to build the space station up, up in the sky and lots of different kinds of science uh, in Earth orbit. So that's something to be proud of looking back, but looking forward, it's something to motivate us, each of us, that you too can do something that nobody will believe in the future. And people will look back at what you did and say, wow, those people must have been scientists. That's the legacy of AIMS, it's the legacy of the space shuttle. It's sad to see a miracle go into a, into a museum, but way more than that, it's proud and it's a shining example of what we humans right here in California, right here in Mountain View, can accomplish it if you if you put your heart to it. So thanks uh, to all of you for your, for all of your heart and your support and enjoy every second of today. It's about the coolest thing you're ever gonna see. And I want to say on behalf of all of us, we really appreciate your contributions to the shuttle program, to the space program, to the nation. And it's just that much extra special for us that you're a local guy, so thank you.